So we're going to uh, move on now. We had the porifera, the sponges, as our first group of animals, um, but they had no true tissues. They're a group of animals that um, develops cell layers of distinct cells, but they lack the connections between the cells required for tissue formation. So this group, now that we're into the phylum Cnidaria, they're going to be our first group of animals that actually has true tissues. So we'll look quickly at that then development. So come back here. We've got unfertilized egg, an ova, fertilized by a sperm. These are both one in haploid cells. They then do a little in between here. Undergo fertilization. Typically, again, this is a broadcast spawning process, meaning that the organisms release the sperm and eggs into the water column. So these are going to be uh, aquatic organisms. Only found in water. And for the most part, I think it's like 98, 99% of all species are marine. So we're pretty much finding them in the ocean. So they're mostly marine. Uh, there are a few freshwater um, species of cnidarian, but very few. People actually are familiar with some of the um, freshwater ones because hydra is a freshwater, um, but they are uh, incredibly much in the minority of groups uh, of cnidaria. They're mostly on the world's oceans. And we find them shallow water to, to deep water. Uh, and so that produces our zygote, right? That's the fertilized egg, the beginnings of the new embryo. And then we get cell division. So we get cleavage, the, the cells start to divide. It starts to form a blastula, if you remember that from before. A little ball of cells. And then we start to have gastrulation occur. And now we actually get real tissue formation. So we have endoderm. Sorry. Outer is ectoderm. The inner, so as the cells move inward like this, that is the endoderm. Okay. So endoderm forms then the digestive tract. And in this particular group, we're going to call that the gastrodermis. And the ectoderm will form what would be the skin, or in this case, the epidermis. Uh, ectoderm can also give rise to nerve cells, and we are going to have um, a very primitive nervous system in the cnidarian. So they, they will not have a brain, um, but they do have nerves. All right? So they can sense structures and they will be able to respond to those with movement. One of the things we'll get into is that for true muscle tissue to form, we need the third type, the type called mesoderm. Now this group is going to be a diploblastic group only having the two tissue types. So we have two true tissues. These are the embryonic tissues right, that form uh, the ectoderm, the outer layer, and the endoderm, the inner layer, giving rise to an epidermis and a gastrodermis. But that's it. There's nothing uh, in between it. We'll talk. We'll go through the tissue the layers in, in a second. Uh, we'll look at, as we look at the body forms. Um, but we'll find that there, there's no mesoderm. So there's no true muscle. So the muscle is caused by uh, other types of contractile cells, cells that can contract and change their shape, but they're not true muscle. So we will have a ner nervous system and we will have movement um, and we're starting to get on that path to forming you know, nerves and muscles and then complex movements and all that are characteristics of animals. So this is on that path to that place, but we're not there yet with this particular group. All right, so basic development then forms this little, this embryo. The embryo generally will form a type of larvae that's covered in cilia like this. This is a multicellular, you know, larvae uh, that is called a planula. Uh, 
And generally, the planula larvae will settle onto the bottom uh, of you know, or, or the ocean. A, a rock usually gets a hard substrate, typically not a soft substrate. So typically not in sand. Um, it would have to usually be on some hard surface. And there a metamorphosis takes place and they form a polyp. And, and so what we have for cnidarians generally are two, two uh, major forms. We have the polyp form and this form referred to as the medusa. So the medusa is generally a pelagic form. It is up in the water column where the polyp is a benthic form. We find it on the bottom on uh, a surface that it's attached to. So and it's a variety of things. I mean, we find some of these on the shell of another organism. So they might attach to another organism. We find them again, a variety of different sorts of places. Um, sometimes the dead skeletons of other cnidarians, you know, might be the place where they land, but they're typically attached to some surface. And then we'll get through the life cycles uh, later. So the polyp is then going to develop and have its a mouth typically and a digestive cavity. So the uh, endoderm forms a gastrodermis, and that gastrodermis will form a digestive cavity. And then this is the epidermis surrounding it. So the question might be, you know, here, what's, what's in between? So now in between the digestive cavity, which is lined with cells called gastrodermal cells, um, and the epidermis uh, is a, another sort of gel-like region called mesoglia. There can be cells uh, in this layer, but the layer isn't made up of cells. The layer is made up of this gel. And in the medusa, which are sometimes called jellyfish, which we'll talk about in a second, we shouldn't use the term fish. They are not, they're not fish at all, but that is a very common uh, term. Uh, and the reason they call jellyfish is because well, that mesoglia jelly sort of layer is very thick. So they typically have a very thick mesoglia in the medusa. And in a polyp, they may not look a whole lot different in, in uh, my drawing here, but it's usually a very thin uh, mesoglia. People say mesoglia uh, is another pronunciation of it, or mesoglia. Um, so, but it's this in-between gel layer. It's not a third tissue type, uh, but there can be cells in it. So keep that in mind. So the polyp form is benthic. Uh, it is usually what we call sedentary uh, and sessile. So these are two words that will come up um, often. So, and they're slightly different. Okay, so sedentary versus sessile. Okay, so... <clears throat> A variety of organisms we're going to talk about will have these characteristics. Now, sponges are sessile. So a sponge is attached to a surface. Uh, it lives on that surface. It's a little filter feeding organism. Uh, and it's collecting water, pulling it into the spongiceal cavity. Then the coenocytes are collecting the particles and it's feeding on them. A sponge won't move to a new site. It's just pretty much stuck there. Okay, So that's sessile. It's just stuck in one place. A sedentary organism relates more to behavior, it tends to stay in one place, but it can move. It has the potential. So on the bottom of a polyp is almost like a little suction cup disc, uh, usually referred to as a basal disc. So I'm going to run out of space here for it, but it's called basal disc. And it's used for attachment to the surface. However, they can release sometimes from the 
surface that they're attached to. So usually it's partly that the shape of it is more like a suction cup and they secrete a mucus that also then uh, helps in the adhesion. But it's not glued in place, which means they can let go essentially and then float up into the water column. There actually are um, videos and I'll link one in uh, my uh, Blackboard course uh, that actually show uh, an anemone, which is a polyp animal like this, letting go of a surface, actually flipping itself upside down, and then actually starting to change its shape and moving and swimming through the water column until it finds a new location that sits. So most of the time it's going to sit in one place and not move around. It's just going to stay there, sedentary. Um, but it can, right? As opposed to being a sessile organism, which is stuck, it's glued to one place, it's never going to get up and move to a new location. It's always going to be in that one uh, environment. So kind of keep those, those terms will come up. I'll use them in the future with other organisms that we talk about. And that way you kind of have heard of them before um, and you'll um, start to remember what they mean. Because I'll say them over and over again. So we have the two forms, Medusa uh, and the polyp. Same basic tissue layers, uh, same basic arrangement, except you know this is sort of like an, you know, an upside down polyp with the mouth here facing downward and here the mouth is facing upward. So the polyp is open, like sometimes people call them a flower animal and that they have, you know, they just kind of, they sit there and then they're opened up and they have all these tentacles. And so this would be a tentacle. And so typically the tentacles are in a ring around the mouth and that would typically be called the oral disc so the area around the mouth and that would be the same thing here so this ring this area around the mouth is this oral disc and then there are tentacles ringing it you know all the way around it and these tentacles can vary in their length so some can be very short and some can be very long and some organisms can uh, by pushing water into them actually change the the length of the tentacles and the movement of the tentacles so they can move them around and some tentacles um, are more stringy and just they don't really change their uh, shape much uh, or their length or, or at any particular time or something that's something that the animal controls they're just that that way but but these types of tentacles we're talking about the animal can change uh, itself now the purpose of the tentacles in both both cases is for typically for feeding or capturing food um, and somewhat for defense now i'll just tell you here Cnidarians, the name right, for the group, comes from the structure here that we're going to talk about, called a nidocyte. And you will see a couple different terms, and sometimes in different places, uh, things are so, sort of mislabeled a little bit. So site means cell. Okay. So when we talk about the nidocyte, we're talking about an actual eukaryotic cell with a nucleus, okay? So this is representing see, the nucleus, all right, in the cell. Inside a nidocyte is an organelle, so this is the cell, uh, called a nematocyst. So a nematocyst is technically an organelle. inside the cell. Now this is a chamber that's released with the nematocyst sort of sticking out and this is sort of the unfired. So this is what we call unfired D. All right, and this is a fired nematocyst. So what is this? Well, there's this chamber inside the cell. And inside the chamber, in this particular case, in this unfired state, all right, is sort of this inverted structure um, that has a little harpoon, so a thread-like harpoon. But in the unfired state, it's coiled around this structure uh, inside the chamber. There is then, on the surface of the cell, a trigger. Okay, so these are little cells. And these cells that I'm talking about here, so these nidocytes, 
are typically found on the outside, but they're, they're in the typically the tentacles themselves. So the tentacles themselves are where we find these uh, nidocyte cells with the nematocysts. We typically do not find them uh, along the sides of the body. Like on a medusa, you would not find them on the top of it or even in the oral disc area um, or here in the polyp sort of along the stalk, you know, or the body overall of the polyp. They're typically just in the tentacles. Usually as well, they're not found in the gastrodermis um, or in the gastrodermal cells, but some do. Some actually have them lining the gastrodermis, but that's not the typical case. Typically, they're just found in the tentacles. So these little structures here, the tentacles with the nidocytes. What happens is that uh, the trigger can be um, activated in, in a couple different ways. Often it's mechanical, so something touches it and then it causes the trigger to fire. Uh, it can be chemical uh, as well, but usually it's a, it's a, it's a mechanical trigger. Um, so the mechanical trigger is activated because something bumps into physically the tentacle. Right? There is some amount of um, chemical recognition as well. So you could say, well, what, what if I, it just bumps into itself? One tentacle hits the other tentacle. Does it sting itself? Typically not because, uh, again, there is a type of chemical sensitivity and um, uh, recognition, you know, to self. So one tentacle doesn't cause another's nematocysts to fire. This is an advantage that some organisms take. So you may be familiar with uh, a classic association between something called a clownfish uh, and an anemone. So an anemone is a cnidarian. It's a polyp animal uh, as an adult. Its tentacles are full of these nidocytes lined with nematocysts and they will fire out this little harpoon like structure that will stick into the tissues of other organisms. They typically feed on fish and so they will stab these into the fish. Now these are tiny, microscopic, but usually hundreds of them or thousands of them might be fired at the same time sticking into the animal's tissues. And then they'll start to contract and then they would pull the animal then into the mouth and then into the digestive cavity. And so they actually release enzymes into the digestive cavity and digest their food in this chamber. Okay, so to kind of keep that in mind. <clears throat> But some fish, say like the clownfish that you might be familiar with, seem to not be affected by. They could kind of swim around through the tentacles and live in an association with the anemone and not be stung. Uh, and that's typically because, well, one, sometimes they do get stung, but they're, they're used to it. Or they're not are really affected by it as much. But most of the time it's because they produce a mucus themselves that mimics the mucus of the anemone. So the anemone sees, doesn't see them as something different, doesn't see them as something that's not self, it sees them as part of themselves, essentially, in a way. Uh, and so they can live in association with them. Um, but for other things, they would then, <clears throat> the trigger is fired when something bumps into it that they recognize as not being part of them. Water rushes in. So a huge amount of water. So this is, uh, I believe uh, this is true, um, but we'll have to verify it to be sure, but it's certainly a very powerful osmotic process. It may be one of the fastest known osmotic responses um, among living things where the amount of water that rushes into this chamber um, over t t in time uh, is more rapid than any measurable uh, movement of water across a cell. So it's incredibly rapid. Um, it may not be the fastest, but it's definitely one of the fastest movements of water across a cell membrane. And that creates pressure, and that pressure pushes the structure out and inverts it, and then that fires um, the little harpoon right, of the nematocyst. So the, the harpoon structure is the nematocyst, and the cell is called the nidocyte. Now, there can be, let's see, I drew on here like little structures sticking off it. There can be barbs. So you can think of just a wire or a needle. You get stuck with a needle, it's just a it would hurt, but it's a, it's just a straight, smooth piece of metal. But now if that little piece of metal had a whole bunch of little spikes sticking out of the sides of it, one, it would hurt a lot more. But secondly, it would be much more difficult to pull back out again. So just like a fishing hook with barbs on it, um, when you're fishing, say, for trout, you use barbless hooks typically. Um, and so they don't damage the fish. 
uh, their mouth. So that, as you can slide the hook back out again. But a barb then sticks into the tissue and actually rips out a lot of the tissue if you try to remove the hook. Same thing here. It's hard to pull these back out again because of all the barbs. Some of them have no toxins associated with them, but many of these organisms also have structures within this nidocyte that produce toxins. And then the toxins then line the nematocyst and this harpoon. So when it fires out, not only does it sting another organism with this little needle-like harpoon, but it's also injecting some type of toxin. So it may have, so it may have toxins associated with this harpoon structure. And they can vary between uh, being, you know, something that are immediately paralytic, you know, to the organism, uh, to something that just causes a burning sensation. So they're something that's more defensive for the organism versus something that's more for prey capture. So they're going to paralyze a prey organism and so it stops moving and it's easier for them to consume uh, versus protecting themselves against a predator. So something goes and bumps into them and is stung and is hurt, you know, is injured by the sting and then they go away and they don't bother the, the organism as well. So there's a whole variety of toxins. Some are, are incredibly dangerous uh, to larger organisms like humans. So there's humans who die from the stings of these nematocysts each year from some different species of cnidaria. So we're still going to do a little bit more here um, before we talk about the diversity within the groups and all. But so far what we have is that uh, cnidarians are a group of animals that are diploblastic. So they have two true tissues, two true embryonic tissues that give rise to adult tissues. One group of tissues lies the digestive cavity, the gut, uh, and that's called the gastrodermis. And then we have ones that line the outside of the animal called the epidermis. And then in between is a gel-like mesog uh, mesoglia, which in the, obviously the jellies, we call them sea jellies, not jellyfish. Uh, the sea jellies is very, very thick gel layer, whereas in a polyp, formed of the organisms, it's very thin. Okay. Now, some of the groups of cnidarians will alternate between these forms. So they have a polyp form and a medusa form. Uh, generally, the medusa form is the one that will reproduce sexually. And the polyp form will be the one that uh, reproduces asexually. So asexual reproduction versus sexual reproduction, typically. That's not always going to be the case. We'll have to talk about a couple exceptions to that. But polyps can then bud and form other polyps, and polyps sometimes do the fission process where they split in half and form other polyps. Medusa don't do that. Medusa usually form uh, gonads and then produce gametes and then release the gametes into the water for fertilization to occur. That's typically what happens. Then the fertilized embryo settles and forms into a plant from the planula larvae into a little polyp. That polyp may develop into uh, just a polyp like this. And but what we'll see is then some asexual reproduction to either produce more polyps in some groups. So a polyp to produce more polyps or the polyps. Uh, we'll talk about this more in detail in the next uh, lecture will asexually produce sort of like different layers of tentacles like this. And then each of them sort of breaks off. And each one actually becomes like a little Medusa. I'll have a better drawing with um, the next talk. So it's kind of like sexual reproduction produces the polyp, but then asexually it cuts itself into pieces. And then the pieces each become a Medusa. All right, so they get many Medusa, say, from a single polyp. So it's sexual and asexual reproduction going on at the same time, not just one or, you know, or the other. And that's also a characteristic of many of the Cnidarian groups. All right. Um, and then we have the, the cells that are the V characteristic cell type of the Cnidarians, exclusive to this group. No other group of animals has the nidocytes. Right, so there's nothing else that has them. Um, and uh, inside is this organelle called the nematocyst, which then fires out a little harpoon-like structure under water pressure. Uh, and then it stings into another organism, prey or predator, depending on how it's being used. 
and can cause harm to those organisms to protect uh, the little polyp or help it capture the food that it's going to eat. All right. So that's the overall introduction to the cnidaria with just some of the basics of the body plan. So this is what we're calling it. Calling this. It's a body, the overall plan or organization of the body uh, and a couple things about its biology and its development. And what we're going to go into next, this will be then the, the next lecture, will be the, the groups of the cnidarians and then how their life cycles differ and then some of the unique ecological roles that the different cnidarians play.